Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window are only visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sharon Farnsworth from Fujifilm Diosense Biotechnology. Hi, I'm Sharon Farnsworth. Um, I'd like to thank BPI, Leah and Chris, for uh, hosting me today as I present. Um, I'm an Associate Principal Scientist and Upstream Project Lead for Fujifilm Diosense Biotechnologies. And today I'm going to briefly discuss some of the challenges of the development and scale up of insect cell culture um, and BEVs. And this is going to be from an upstream perspective since that's my area of expertise. So first I'd like to introduce um, who we are as a company and what it is we do here at Fujifilm Diosynth Biotechnologies. We have three sites globally, um, one in Billingham, UK, um, that's in northern England, and then we have a College Station, Texas uh, location, and I'm located here in the Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina um, facility. All of our facilities, um, we have similar capabilities, and we have 20 more, or more years of experience um, to the development over 280 molecules, and this has resulted in six licenses for commercial manufacturing. Our capabilities also include um, cell culture and microbial fermentation, so it's not just a cell culture, insect cell culture facility. We also do um, a significant amount of uh, microbial fermenta fermentation, um, and we do have the virus capabilities with the acquisition of our Texas facility, so we do a lot of um, just regular viruses, not necessarily um, just baclovirus. Um, we have exceptional flexibility in our plant um, configurations with the uh, implementation of all the single-use work that we have done, um, and we have that at all three facilities. And we have uh, single-use capabilities all the way from 2 liters to 2,000 liters, and we have also completed over 2,000 GMP batches with all the various um, volumes um, at the different bioreactor scales. So just to introduce my topic, um, I'd first like to quickly walk through some of the definitions um, of what we're referring to and what the difference is between the insect cell culture ICC and um, the BEVs is. Um, we do tend to collectively refer to this as baclovirus culture, and I'll probably um, waver between the, the three different terminologies, um, but I'll, I'll go over this, the specificities of, of each of the definitions. And then I'll highlight why we use baclovirus, why we shouldn't use baclovirus, and then what we look for when, we, when we're developing and scaling up the various stages of insect cell culture and BEVs. So to be precise, um, the process that we develop is an insect cell culture process, an ICC. Um, typical cell lines that we use in the production of bac baclovirus and recombinant proteins, VLPs, which are virus-like proteins, um, are typically SF21, SF9, and, and we're starting to see a lot of HI5 um, enter the industry as well. The baclovirus expression vector system, or BEVs, um, this is the vector that carries the gene um, of interest, and it's carried into the process via the baclovirus. Um, there are more than 500 of these types of baclaviruses and that can infect and produce recombinant proteins in, in various um, insect cells. So the advantage of this system is that it's capable of producing um, very large proteins. And I have high concentrations in, in parentheses because for CHO um, people that's 20 mg per liter or 15 mg per liter is, is, is not a high concentration, but these are very large proteins, so we, we can get um, high concentrations of those proteins in the BEV system. Um, it's capable of producing um, VPLs, um, and these are the virus-like proteins, and these have been extensively used in vaccine production as they can mimic the nature 
of the virus and result hopefully in a safer prophylaxis compared to attenuated or inactivated viral vaccines, which has been the industry standard until this point. Um, it's also capable of minimum pro post-translational modifications, um, not to the extent of CHO, um, so this can also be a disadvantage. And finally, they're relatively inexpensive to produce. Um, they're relatively straightforward to produce, and there's not a lot of um, extra components that go into the, to the growth of um, making the baclovirus processes. Some of the main disadvantages as they pertain to manufacturability mostly um, is that um, there's no real robust chemically defined media available at this time. Um, and this can lead to significant variations in the process, especially as you start scaling up and go into, manufacture, into manufacturing where you want everything to be consistent and very robust. Um, determining your protein titer can sometimes um, not be very straightforward because this is a protein and not a monoclonal antibody. Um, so you, you have to use a lot of different methods um, in order to determine your protein titer. Um, and determining your virus titer can be complicated or very inconsistent. Um, it is advantageous to have real-time virus titers that can be particularly beneficial, especially if your virus stocks are unstable, which a lot of times they are. The first um, key process step um, I'd like to discuss is the seed train and scale up. <clears throat> the growth of um, insect cell culture is relatively standard to mammalian cell culture. Um, however, recovery out of thaw sometimes takes a lot longer um, to produce consistent doubling times. Um, so both minimum and maximum passage numbers need to be evaluated to ensure that not only you have consistent seed train, but you also have an efficient and robust infectivity because your doubling times and your passage number can impact how um, infective your virus is into the system. Um, and this can also help determine your cell cycling strategy, um, how long you can passage your cells, and how long um, ultimately your GMP cell bank is going to need to be. The infection cell density, um, this is the cell density at which you will infect your culture, um, and this is what will begin <clears throat> your protein production. Um, the MOI is the amount of virus stock you'll add to your culture at infection, um, and this can be the most significant and impactful body of work for reproducibility um, in making robust and high-yielding manufacturing processes. Um, these two parameters typically go hand-in-hand -hand, um, when you're doing your studies, and the outcome of the study can significantly impact how large your virus bank is um, and what your virus stock strategy is going to be later on. So when you're developing your virus bank and your virus stock strategy for scale-up and manufacturing, you'll need to determine how the virus stock will be created from the virus bank and if you will use a primary or a secondary derived virus stock. Um, the stability of your virus stock and the ICD and MOI um, will impact the size of your virus bank and the resulting stock needed for manufacturing. So all these need to be determined once you start looking towards your manufacturing scale. Um, the harvest step can also be critical to the process. When you harvest um, will typically be determined by your protein production capabilities and whether production is through your primary or secondary infection. Um, once your peak cell size begins to decline, productivity typically becomes minimal and it would be time to, to harvest at that, uh, um, at that point. Um, a time-based harvest is ultimately um, the best method for GMP manufacturing, and this just allows for more consistent scheduling once the GMP manufacturing is to begin or commercial processing um, is to start. How the culture is to be harvested can also be critical. A low temperature or low pH hold can help you with your filtration, um, and it can also help in um, further deactivating any remaining live viruses. <clears throat> and a final note to the process consistency will lie with your media. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the media remains your most varial part of the process. Um, there is currently no chemically defined media that has been used successfully for the entirety of the process. Um, we do continually evaluate them when they become available from various vendors, but there's nothing that has worked for both scale-up and um, infection. Um, the re main reason behind this is 
the nutrient needs for seed train and scale up, they can be significantly different than when the nutrients need once you have infection. And that's just because there's no protein production or no virus um, infecting the cells. Um, the media that's currently available um, and used successfully throughout um, seed train as well as infection typically have some sort of yeast slate um, or yeast extract derivative. And this is just to ensure that one medium can supply the needs of both cell growth and production after infection. Um, there are cases where supplementation at infection um, can be evaluated, and this can help increase productivity in titers um, in some processes. So in summary, um, process inf improvements, it's a continuous journey. Um, it is with any other cell culture, but um, even more so with baclovirus cultures, just because there's so many different moving parts to the process. Um, keeping a line of sight from into manufacturing, it can help define the process and determine how to make the best process decisions for scale up and how to make the process itself more reliable and robust. Um, managing that data from the early stages into the late stages, this can help your process character characterization activities as well as your process validation activities as you move towards commercial processing, and that's just so you're not repeating things that were not successful or caused, you know, less robust um, processes, you know, early in the in the development life cycle. Um, Fujifilm itself, we have about 14 years experience um, with baclovirus cultures, um, and 10 of these have been in commercial manufacturing of baclovirus. And this is just uh, um, important because it helps us to be able to minimize the time necessary. Um, to refine the processes that come in and to ensure readiness for our facility fit. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I open it up for any questions that you may have for me. Thank you, Sharon. So the first question is, you mentioned that the absence of chemically defined media is a big challenge. What strategies do you use to minimize the variability? So a lot of the things that we do um, is to do growth promotion as well as um, uh, tighter uh, analysis um, evaluations on, on every new lot of media that comes in. And it's not necessarily every new lot of media, but every new lot of whatever the, um, the unknown component is. So if we have a different lot of yeast extract or yeast delay coming in, we do a growth promotion and a, a productivity evaluation before we um, before we bring that into the plant. Okay. And are there? You mentioned that peak cell size begins to decline, and that that is the time for peak harvest. Is there any process analytical technology or any tools that you use to determine that? Like, what what technology do you use to determine when the peak cell size is declining? So the the easiest way, the easiest methodology is just through your cell count. So we, we use a vice cell here at Fujifilm Desense, and um, the vice cell will give you not only your, your viable cell density, but it will also give your average cell size. And, um, and what we do, what a lot of the, the first um, checks that we'll do is um, we'll, we'll, once the, the virus starts infecting the cells, the cells start swelling, of course. And so um, usually about 24 to 48 hours is when your productivity starts declining um, once your cell size goes back to its normal size. Um, that just mostly means most of the virus has, has escaped and most of your protein is in the solution now. Okay. So we have a question. Um, are VLPs assemble inside the SF9 nucleus? Uh, what harvest procedure would you recommend? <laughs> um, so th this is where I feel like we start entering the, the realm of, of what I call fermentation. And so there's a lot of, um, usually we'll, we'll do a centrifugation step, um, and that's when you remove most of the, uh, the supernate, which is just the opposite of what cell culture people typically do. And then you'll do some sort of homogenization or um, some sort of chemical slicing of the, of the cells. And then we'll, we'll do another centrifugation and then a filtration after that. Um, and it just depends on, on how sticky they are inside the cells once you, you know, burst them open and, and that. So it's, there's, there can be several steps 
post homogenization um, if they're actually sticking to the cell membranes inside the cells as well. So there are several different steps that you have to perform. <laughs> and um, for the low temp or the low pH hold, um, how long is that? Can you hold them there? Like, what, what's an optimal time? Do you have studies? So that depends a lot on um, not just the, the hardiness of the virus, but also the hardiness of your protein. Um, typically, it's somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour is, is about how long we'll do, especially a low pH hold. Um, low temperature holds you can usually do and have to do longer, um, just because usually proteins are fine with, with cold. Um, but if it's, a, if it's a chemical or a pH um, uh, hold, then it's, it's typically um, somewhere between a half hour to an hour. Um, I have seen them as long as 12 hours for pretty hardy proteins. Okay. And finally, are there any regulatory challenges that you should be aware of in the approval of an ICC-based process? Um, they're, they're pretty similar to what you would see with CHO, um, with the exception that a lot of these are going into vaccines and there's a lot more and a lot different regulatory um, challenges to, to vaccines. Um, a lot of these, um, there, there's a little, um, little more uh, watching by the industry with the, with the vaccines just because they want to get them out onto the market as quick as they can. Um, so, uh, but th th it's still relatively similar to, to the MABs. Okay. And actually, I have a couple more questions that just came in. So, are your ICC process um, single-use bioreactors or stainless steel, and what scale? So we have um, processes both in um, stainless uh, reactors as well as in the single-use reactors. Um, we've, we've run um, several of our processes in both stainless and the single-use reactors. Um, in th they either are extremely similar or they seem to like the single-use system slightly better. So um, we have been able to, to run them interchangeably between the two. Our commercial processes are still with stainless, but that's just because, it, you know, that's historical. Um, and we have, uh, for our GMP manufacturing, we have 50 liters to 2,000 liter scale um, that we can run processes. And then, of course, um, between our PD and our pilot scale, we have anywhere from 2 liters to 200 liters um, that we can use for, for those, uh, for smaller scales. Okay, and the question is, do you have, I believe, adeno-associated virus experience with ICC, but I'm not sure that that's the right. So myself personally, no. <laughs> Um, but we do have a lot of experience with that um, at our Texas facility. So a lot of that work is currently being done by our Texas facility. Okay. And I think you touched on this in the beginning, but the question on the, the, what is the range of yields obtained per liter? Um, so it, that is completely dependent on your protein. Um, the, the yields for insect cell culture are typically a lot lower than what you would see with mammalian cell culture where, you know, you're trying um, for your monoclonals trying to get, you know, 80 to 90 percent yields um, in mammalian cell culture. Um, it, it's depending on the protein and the fussiness of the protein, you can see anywhere between 20 percent yield all the way up to 60, 70 percent yield, but they are typically a lot less than what you would see with your monoclonal antibodies. Okay. Well, thank you, Sharon. And thanks to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you will receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Thanks again, and have a great day.